So good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Cal Rastiala. I direct the Burkle Center for International Relations, and it's a great pleasure to have all of you here today for this year's Bernard Brody Lecture. So our mission at the Burkle Center is to enrich the understanding of international affairs here at UCLA and in LA. And one of the ways that we do this is by bringing the best thinkers and policymakers to campus to give us a chance to discuss and debate the most pressing issues with them. And the Bernard Brody Lecture has been an important part of our uh, portfolio of activities for over three decades. So the list of past Brody lecturers includes presidents, prime ministers, secretaries of state and defense, national security advisors, Nobel Prize winners, and US senators. And I'm really happy to add Ambassador Mike McFall to that list, former US ambassador to Russia. Um, Mike McFall is one of our uh, great political scientists in this country, but he's also served our country at the highest levels. He will get a proper introduction in a moment from Congressman Ted Lieu, um, but I just wanna repeat how enthusiastic I am. I think he'll, um, he'll enlighten us about a lot of very important issues, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk and having a chance to sit down and chat with him. So, um, so as mentioned, uh, Congressman Ted Lieu will, will give him a proper introduction. Uh, Ambassador McFall has a talk with slides, uh, which will take about 30 minutes, and then he and I will sit down in those chairs to discuss the talk and a few other issues, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. We do have handheld microphones, so if you have a question, when that time comes, please raise your hand. Uh, just wait for me to call on you and wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, and again, uh, keep your questions short and to the point. I know we have um, only limited time, and I hope we can cover a lot of issues. So with that in mind, um, let me introduce Congressman Ted Lieu. Ted Lieu was elected to Congress in 2014, representing the 33rd District, and was immediately chosen as president of the freshman class of Democrats. Prior to his service in Washington, Congressman Lieu was a California State Senator, California State Assembly Member, and Council Member for the City of Torrance. Ted Lieu was born in Taipei and grew up in Ohio before moving to California for college. Like Ambassador McFall, he's a graduate of Stanford University. He also received his law degree from Georgetown and was an active duty JAG in the US Air Force. Congressman Liu remains a member of the Air Force Reserve. Uh, in fact, he came today in his Air Force uniform, though he's changed out of it just in time. Please join me in welcoming to UCLA, Congressman Ted Liu. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction and uh, I'm so honored to be here uh, particularly at UCLA and uh, particularly uh, with the Burkle Center. And uh, thanks to Burkle Center for the great work and research you do on uh, international relations and foreign policy and the complex issues of uh, global conflict and cooperation. I'm also thrilled to be here because I'm a recovering political science major. And I'm always thrilled to uh, be at uh, speeches about foreign policy. Uh, lately, we've heard a lot about ISO. Uh, they are spectacularly good at beheading people. But if you were to ask our intelligence agencies, uh, do they pose a threat to U.S. homeland or an existential threat, the answer would be no. Uh, but Russia does. Uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal, as you know, can wipe America off uh, as a country as we know it. Uh, their military under the right conditions uh, can defeat our troops on a battlefield. And that's why the work that Ambassador Mike McFall does, did, and continues to do is so important. Uh, in hindsight, it's obvious why he is a Russian expert. He grew up in a place like Russia, a place that's cold and stoic. It's known as Montana. Um, few people and lots of huckleberries. Uh, actually, I like Montana. I was active duty in the Air Force. I went to Malmsbury Air Force Base. I did some duty there, and it's a beautiful state. Uh, but Ambassador McFall uh, now is currently director of the Freeman Spogli uh, Institute at Stanford. He is also uh, the Peter Hellebing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a member of Stanford faculty since 1995. He currently uh, is also an analyst for NBC News. Uh, prior to this, uh, he served for five years in the Obama administration, first as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russian and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council at the White House from 2009 to 2012. And then he was U.S. Ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2012 to 2014. He's written numerous books, uh, including Advancing Democracy Abroad, Why We Should, How We Can, as well as Transitions to Democracy, A Comparative Perspective, and Russia's Unfinished Revolution, Political Change from Gorbachev to Putin. 
He received his BA in international relations and Slavic languages and his MA in Soviet and East European studies from Stanford in 1986. He is also a Rhodes Scholar, uh, getting uh, a degree in international relations at Oxford University in 1991. So it's our honor now to uh, welcome Ambassador Mike Murfall. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Cal. It is a real honor to be here. Um, I saw the list of previous speakers, uh, pretty daunting list, but they probably didn't have videos. So uh, if, if I'm not, <laughs> you judge the talk by the other ones if you've seen them, uh, but I bet you I'm the first one that, I bet you there weren't any presidents that brought videos from Russia in Russia. So that'll be a first at least. So um, I want to, let me see. So, I, okay, the videos are, the, the slides are here. So I'm somewhere in between a recovering bureaucrat and an aspiring professor, right? I'm somewhere in between. And what I want to do today is going to be part analytic, part retrospective, part talking as a policymaker, part talking as a political science type. And I want to, I want to try to, do, I, Cal, I forgot my watch. So uh, tell, me what, tell me when we get to like five minutes, and I'll rush through to the end if I need to. Always dangerous for a professor to not bring their watch. As ambassador, I could talk as long as I wanted. People stayed. Um, but here's the question. And, and let me just start, actually, with um, a, uh, an anecdote, from a memory I have when I just got back from Stanford about a year ago. And I went over to my neighbor's house. who just wanted to catch up. You know, we hadn't, I've been away for five years. He wanted to hear about what life was like in Russia and working at the White House. And I started telling some of my stories, of which I'm going to tell you in a minute, about my time there. And that kind of got his memory going. And he started to tell his stories. And the more we got into it, his stories were much more upbeat, optimistic uh, than my stories. My, my neighbor's George Schultz. Um, <laughs> And George was reflecting on his time in government, his time with dealing with the Russians, his time in dealing with Edward Shevardnadze, and then Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. And that ended in a great way, as we all know. That's the end of the Cold War. Uh, some called it the end of history. Some thought, thought this was going to be a, a brand new era in US-Russian relations. He most certainly did. And as I left, that my, my Cadillac wasn't waiting for me, but my one speed Schwinn bicycle was, um, and I thought about all the negative stuff that happened on my watch, you know, the big question is, what happened? Now, the easy thing to say is, I'm not George Schultz. Uh, you know, I screwed it all up. He made it all happen well. But we know correlation and causation are not exactly the same thing. But I want to answer that one big question. As you, if you, maybe if we'll have time, I have a second smaller question, what, what, what will come later. But I want to just answer this big question, this why question. What happened from then to this period of confrontation that we're in now? I think it's fair to say this, we could argue about it, and there's lots of experts in this room and lots of Russians in this room. So I'm, you know, more, I gave this speech in Montana State. I, I would say this more definitively there. Uh, there weren't a bunch of people speaking Russian when I stood up to speak behind me, as there were just now. But I think you got to go pretty deep into the Cold War to remember a time that is as confrontational uh, as it is today. I mean, just think about these kinds of things. Russia intervening in the neighborhood, annexing territory, threatening to use nuclear weapons. We're now at 83% in terms of a negative approval rating among Russians. Uh, that, that was just from a couple months ago. Um, and if you listen to Putin talk about the way he thinks about our country, it's not just in some kind of balance of power politics. It's about, you know, a big struggle against this unipolar imperial country that he calls the United States. And sometimes he talks about us, you know, fighting, that the Russia's fighting Nazis and, and evil. They even use the word evil. They're fighting evil. For him, this is a struggle between good and evil. And on our side, even with uh, President Obama, who's a much more measured person, I would say, uh, analytically in the way he talks about these things, and yet, you know, some pretty, uh, you know, pretty big stuff is happening in terms of our U.S.-Russian relations. At the U.N. last year, he said the three greatest threats to the world are Ebola, ISIS, and Russia. Not a great list to be on. Um, <laughs> Most certainly did not go down too well in Moscow, by the way, to be on that list. 
Uh, Western sanctions. Do you remember the last time Russian leaders were on a sanctions list? You can't because it's never happened before. Uh, that's pretty profound. That's a big thing. NATO's now focused on the, the threat from Russia again. I was just in Tallinn two weeks ago and, you know, the old gangs back together to talk about how to deter Russian aggression. Uh, Russia got kicked out of the G8. That didn't happen in other crises that we've had and even other interventions we've had. So, and Americans now see Russia as an enemy again in our uh, public opinion poll data, right? So, that's what I want to, I, I want to understand. How did we get from this to this. <laughs> I was at that meeting, by the way. That's in Los Cabos uh, uh, on the sidelines of a G20 meeting. Um, and they called it Bodygate, the journalists, because they didn't say much, but their body said a lot about where we're at. OK, so here's, I want to I tease through in the next 20 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes, uh, looking at Cal, 15 minutes. Um, uh, three big kind of explanations about how we got here. And what I want to say up front is that, you know, I'm going to simplify, uh, you know, as I go through these explanations. It's, of course, it's a little bit of each. But I'm going to end with number three, just so you know where I'm going. Uh, and if you're in, in social sciences, the, the, the first one is a more of a structural argument, and we're going to work through to a more agent kind of focus, right? So in the structure versus agents, what explains history, I'm going to lean on the agency side. Although you're going to see that there's going to be pieces of these other ones where I'm going. Uh, and I just want to walk you through, but my bluff as we, do you remember that from your time in the Pentagon? I learned this from a, a General Petraeus, actually. My bottom line up front, that's, what you, that's, that's a term they use in the government, in the Pentagon, is that number three is going to be the main Punchline. So you know where I'm going. That's going to be my main explanation. But let's start with the first one. Nature of international politics. So um, if we could just run this video just for a little bit. This is Europe in 1010-50. Uh, you know, we're reaching 1100. And what you see here is the rise of powers, the decline of powers, and borders changing. Right? Um, and so one theory to explain what's happening in Russia today is this is just continuity with history going back 1,000, 2,000, some would say several thousand years, right? And you see, you know, borders change a lot in the place that we now call Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine's not on the map right now. There goes Lithuania. Lithuania has Ukraine, okay. Now they're going to lose it in a few minutes. Uh, we're now at 1,400. Uh, notice that the Mongols are still in charge. Russian Rus has not even come on the map. Anyway, you get the picture, right? And so if you have a theory of politics that looks at this history and thinks of it as just this is the rise and fall of states and their power, then what we see in Russia is not that different from a thousand years of history. Russia was weak. Now Russia is stronger. They now have new capabilities. And so, therefore, we should expect these corrections from a time when Russia was weak. And this is the kind of argument you can find uh, not just in Russia, by the way. This is very popular in Russia, as you might think, but it's, a, it's popular among uh, certain kinds of thinkers about uh, of international relations uh, uh, generally. And I want to be clear that part of this explanation is part of my explanation which is to say, if Russia had, you know, think of the counterfactual. If Russia had no power, if Russia had the same power capabilities as, I don't want to insult anybody. Anybody from Moldova? <laughs> Nobody? OK, then I'll insult Moldova. So, you know, if Russia had the same power capabilities as Moldova, we wouldn't be talking about Russia today, right, or, or other countries. Now, there's another argument about weak states create other problems. We can talk about that maybe in questions, but this is a necessary part of it. That without this capacity, uh, Russia would not have annexed uh, uh, Crimea, would not be in eastern Ukraine, and we would not be having this, this concern about Russia. And I agree with the congressman. This is one of the biggest threats to the United States, I think, uh, you know, at least on the top three, and we'll be on that top three for a long time. But I have a couple of problems with just stopping at that, just stopping at capabilities and not talking about other variables. First, I can imagine rising powers that don't invade their neighbors, right? Germany and Japan after World War II, 
Poland after the collapse of communism. Uh, you know, they didn't go on and invading and try to recorrect the borders from a time when they were weak. And we can, we can think about other cases. And you know, to think about IR theory, we can think about the nature of the regime type and whether they're hostile or not to democracies. And you know, democracies don't go to war most often with each other. And so we could, we could talk about why that may be true. But I can think of some counterexamples. So there has to be more to the story than just power. But second, more importantly, even if that dem democratic peace stuff you don't buy, why now then? Why are we having these troubles now? Why didn't we have them before? Russia invaded Chechnya twice. They had a lot of capability back then. Why is it all happening now? And what's really confusing to me is that when I was ambassador, um, and actually when I was in the administration for the five years, but especially when I was ambassador, if you were to have asked me, what's the number one foreign policy objective of Putin? Say, January 2012 when I showed up. Our team at the embassy would have reported to you the creation of the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, I'm guessing most people have never heard of that because our reporters didn't write about it. Uh, they weren't focused on it. It's hard to write about trade packs, by the way. It's hard to write about TPP. It's confusing. But there's no doubt in our mind at the time, this is what he was focused on. And part of the focus of making this thing happen was to get Ukraine, all of Ukraine, not just Crimea, into this Eurasian Economic Union. That was his focus. Part of the reason he needed to do that is he wanted those 40 million or so consumers to be part of this big thing because Belarus and Kazakhstan weren't adding that many consumers that, to make this thing work. Uh, how many people here have bought something other than a doll or vodka call, uh, with the label on the back, made in Russia? What did you buy? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> what did you buy? Actually, yeah, what did you buy? Made in Russia. Oh, no, nah, yeah. Oh, my iPhone? No. Uh, I what? What? Sure. Made in Russia? Where did you, you come from? 40% of your food came, were, were imported. Depends on where you ate, my friend. Okay, well, <laughs> okay, Moscow. Even Moscow, you're not consuming too many things made in Russia. But how about in America? Anybody? Well, the point is, in, in, up in Menlo Park, you can buy Baltica beer. I don't know if you know Baltica Siem. Okay, Baltica Dievit, Baltica Siem, you can buy that. Uh, but there's one country in the world that buys a lot of goods from Russia, and that's Ukraine. And that's why it was important, it was imperative to him to get them all in. Two other data points that are confusing about this, this story. Right before the Olympics happened, uh, Putin let Hartikovsky out of jail. Number one enemy of Hartikovsky. Remember, he was a billionaire, went to jail 10 years earlier. Uh, it was a surprise to us and the government, I'll tell you honestly. And, and one day, I was over at the Kremlin talking to Putin's national security advisor. I asked him, why'd you do it? He said, this was a signal to you, you Americans, that we got to get things back on track. We got we to get things fixed. We're off the rails. That was just two months before he invaded Ukraine. Moreover, how many people were at the Olympics? by chance. Anybody? You're there. What were you doing there? Watching hockey. Me too. Where are you from? I watched the game where we defeated you. Um, <laughs> but, but it was a terrible tragedy for both of our countries, uh, let's be honest, because then I had to watch, wasn't it the Swedes and the Canadians in the final? Uh, we both had to watch that game. Um, I don't know what you thought, but I thought it was a fantastic party. I thought it was a great event. Uh, you know, despite the arguing about you know, the yellow water and the doors that didn't work, and actually I got locked in the stadium one time in a door, and, but luckily I had bodyguards uh, that freed me. But it was a big positive event. Lots of, lots of people your age running around in these colorful outfits, right? Being very friendly, and the message was this is not the Soviet Union, this is not the 1980 Olympics, were different. We're, we want to be a respected member of the world. Um, and I don't know, you know, others might have other views, but I remember very vividly the closing ceremony where they had all these faces of writers come across the field and then they would flip them up. Uh, and then people would applaud. Uh, just a footnote, like how many countries could 
roll across the stadium 50 photographs of writers and people in the stadium would know who they are. I'm not so sure we could do that here in America. You know, pretty rich culture. Uh, but two jumped out at me. One was Brodsky and one was Solzhenitsyn. And that was to say, we're claiming these folks. This is part of the new Russia. We're not part of the Soviet Union. So two weeks later, actually just two days later, he invades Crimea. Something more must be going on in the story. All right, let me go through these other ones a little faster. So the second explanation, of course, is that it's all our fault. Congressman, it's your fault. Uh, America is to blame. This is all our problem. We created all this problem. And this comes in two varieties. I, I know the, the electoral, I looked up the, how you all vote down here. So one of them is going to be more popular down here than others. But if I was in Idaho, uh, the other one would be more popular. So I want to do both. So the first is that it was all of our aggression towards Russia that created this reaction, right? We lectured them about democracy, markets, then we expanded NATO, then we bombed Serbia, then we invaded Iraq, we did the color revolutions, and Putin just had to push back. That just, you know, there would have to be a reaction to all of this Western pressure. And just for the sake of being honest, I want to be clear that I was worried about this too. Uh, this is something I wrote, for those of you who know Russian and Soviet history well, August 19th is an important date, 1990, one year before the coup, one year before the coup that led to the collapse, but I was worried that there would be this backlash uh, and that we would not embrace uh, Russia as they reform. But there's one really big problem with this explanation, is that after all of that negative stuff that I just listed, we had a period that we called the reset, where we were doing things in cooperation with the Russians. We got a lot of things done. We signed a new START treaty. We got rid of 30% of the nuclear, well, we will when it's over, 30% of the nuclear weapons uh, in the world. We expanded something you probably never heard of, the Northern Distribution Network. This is a supply route for our soldiers through Russia and through other countries in the north. Uh, uh, when I went into the government, it was 3% of our supply routes. When I left the government, it was over 50%. In other words, the Russians were helping us fight that war in uh, Afghanistan. And I just want to remind you, because we were talking about it uh, uh, before we came over here, because of the Cy Hirsch piece, this was instrumental for us to be able to do some very, you know, extraterritorial things in Pakistan. Think about had we just had 3% uh, through the north, the other route is through Pakistan, 95% the day that President Obama decided to go in after Osama bin Laden. That would have changed that calculation radically. By the way, the day before the operation against Mr. bin Laden, we were in calling a, a leader in that part of the world to enhance NDN because we knew there would be this reaction from the Pakistanis, and there was. They closed it down. Third, we got in place the most comprehensive set of sanctions against Iran ever, ever. We did that in cooperation with the Russians, not in, antagonism, in an antagonistic relations with them. And then, you know, there are a lot of dogs that didn't bark. The, the, you know, do, you, do you remember the big revolution from 2010? Uh, I have it up there, so it's, you know, I, it's stupid to ask a rhetorical question. It's there, the Kyrgyzstani revolution. Dozens of people died. 300,000 people left Kyrgyzstan. Uh, for me, I was working at the National Security Council that, at, during this crisis. Without question, it was the scariest event that happened to, uh, on my watch because I feared we were on the eve of another genocidal war. Uh, and across the hall, by the way, uh, my colleague was Samantha Power, who had just uh, had written a very famous book about how this, we never again, and it felt like it was happening, but this revolution didn't lead to this big standoff with the Russians. We actually called Medvedev. We said, we both have an interest in not letting this thing blow up. And we managed it. You know, it's still a ways to go, but it most certainly didn't become uh, this ethnic genocidal war that we were fearing. And I could go on. These are, these are Russian and Americans training in 2010 in Colorado. That was just four years ago, four years ago. Uh, reset, you know, we got some economic things done. This is our former governor with the former president at Cisco. Uh, we got him into the WTO. We got PNCR. We liberalized the visa regime. 
uh, trade went up. It was still pretty small, but it was going in the right direction through this, this period of cooperation from 2009 to 2012. And here you can see that popular attitudes, you know, we, were, we got up to 60% of Russians had a favorable view of the United States. That was just four years ago. 83% negative now. And, you know, my point, and by the way, same in our country, say almost exactly the same data. So you can't explain all of that cooperation looking at these same variables from the past that are the explanation for why there's conflict now, right? There's got to be something else to the story that, to bring it in to, to make the story complete. Now, there's one other uh, explanation. It's all Obama's fault, not because he did too much, because he did too little. He's weak, and that created the permissive conditions. He just dared Putin to invade uh, Ukraine because he's so weak. Uh, and this is a, oh, this is your, this is your colleague, Congressman. Um, this is what Speaker Boehner said. Uh, you probably can't see that, so let me read it to you. When you look at this chaos, I, li I like to read this one. When you look at the chaos that's going on, does anybody think that Vladimir Putin would have gone into Crimea had George W. Bush been president of the United States? No. Even Putin is smart enough to know that Bush would have punched him in the nose in about 10 seconds. <laughs> now, let's give the speaker uh, a break. This was 10 days before the election. Uh, not you, Congressman, but I'll bet, you know, other politicians have been known to say kind of things they don't really want to say just 10 days before an election. So let's not overstate that. But it's an argument out there. And most certainly, you're going to hear this argument as we run into our presidential election. And, you know, I'll, I'll skip the first part in the interest of time. But I would just remind you that actually all American presidents, Democrat, Republican, strong, weak, over the last 70 years, have not been very good at deterring Russian aggression. Uh, going back to 56, 68, uh, cracked down in, in Poland in, 80, 80, in December 81, even Ronald Reagan, who I don't think anybody would accuse of being weak on the Soviets, couldn't stop that from happening. And most certainly, with no disrespect to President Bush, but actually, the, the, your Speaker Boehner should know that Russia did invade a country when George Bush was president, and he didn't punch him in the nose. Actually, they did very little. Uh, the more interesting question, maybe for in, in our Q&A, is the response afterwards. And let me say provocatively, I think Barack Obama's response has been more like Ronald Reagan's and less like George W. Bush in terms of response afterwards. But hopefully, we can get that in that in question. So let me get to the, my final explanation. I'll try to do this quickly. Russian domestic politics. Two things here, I think, are essential for understanding why we're in the mess we're in today. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with internal politics in Russia. First is the switch from Putin to Medvedev. This happened in September 2011 when Prime Minister Putin, that's the, that's the guy shouting on the left, uh, announced that he was going to run for president. And President Medvedev said, I'm going to be prime minister now. Uh, I remember that day. Uh, I saw the president a day or two afterwards. Uh, he asked me, what do I think? You know, what does this mean? Um, and I said, well, Mr. President, you know Medvedev a lot better than you know Putin. So that personal investment that you've made, you know, uh, that's now diminished in terms of its utility for us. But I said to the president, remember, Putin's always the big dog. He's always been the key decision maker. Uh, so why should we expect um, uh, that there would be change? And I was dead wrong about that. Uh, because Putin has a very different worldview than Prime Minister Medvedev in terms of these things, seeing the world in zero-sum terms. And most importantly, this one. As he thinks of the United States as a competitor who's willing to use power, covert power and overt power, to undermine regimes that we don't like. Medvedev didn't think that. The second piece related to that is this event that happened between this announcement to run for president and March 2012, which is that in between there are parliamentary elections, stolen just at the kind of levels that they always have been stolen at in Russia, you know, four or five percent. At least that was our assessment. This time, however, there are a bunch of young people who documented it with their smartphones and Vukontakte and Facebook and Twitter, and that then triggered this, demonstrations in Russia for the first time since 1991. 
They didn't want their vote just to be stolen. They wanted to demand from their government something better. And that was shocking to Putin. First, he was pissed. He was really pissed. And, and you know, he said, I made these people rich, you guys. You know, I made you rich. Uh, how can you turn against me now? And then he got frightened. He got worried about what this might mean. Uh, and he decided that he had to make these people the enemy, call them the fifth column, and associate them as being our puppets related to us, right? And that happened right as I landed in Russia, by the way, right as, right as I sh flew in, uh, became ambassador, that turn happened, and I therefore became part of this drama, right? So Navalny is somebody you, you may know, he's an opposition leader. He was portrayed as being my guy, my person that I created, with Mikhail Gorbachev, by the way, good company. Uh, but this was all uh, part of this turn towards us, part of this driven by the domestic challenges. Uh, this is a calendar they put out in 2012 in Russian and English. Uh, all the other uh, months are famous opposition leaders. Uh, May 6th, for the Russians and, and people that follow Russia, you know this was a big demonstration. Uh, May 6, 2012. Here I am portrayed as the ringmaster, the uh, artistic, artistic uh, director of the circus that has again come to Moscow. Um, and here I am uh, photoshopped in campaigning for Navalny uh, when he ran for mayor um, uh, in Moscow. And here, I know we're running out of time, but give me just a few minutes. Just, I want you to get a, this is a flavor for what's on Russian TV today and the way that if we could run this one. Um... Страсти по Макфолу. В российской оппозиции паника. Увольняют посла США в России Майкла Макфола. So they're saying McFaul's been thrown out, and so the opposition is, is in a big panic because I've been thrown out. So when I was named ambassador, it was a holiday for the opposition because they knew I was coming to foment revolution in their country. I'm a specialist. I did not have a plane like that, by the way. Uh, uh, they're saying I'm a specialist about orange revolutions, color revolutions, and I've come to stimulate these, these friends of mine, including these fascists. Okay, you get, a, you get a sense for it. I'll, I'll, I'll cut, we'll play it later in questions if you want to see it. It's really kind of jarring. There's Mr. Yashin, who, by the way, just uh, uh, released the NEMSOF report today. This is on Russian television every day. This is just from a month ago, where our president is being compared uh, in ideological terms. He's basically the same guy, ideologically, as the head of ISIS. That's on Channel One television. Uh, for those who follow Russian TV, that's Mr. Kisilov's uh, station. So two last things, and then we'll take questions. The one thing I want to remind you of, in my opinion, this was not inevitable. There was a different way to respond to these demonstrations. And I just would note here, this is President Medvedev meeting in a roundtable talk with opposition leaders. By, at the end, by the way, is Mr. Nemtsov, who was assassinated recently. I, the first and only time I met the opposition altogether was this same day. As they were coming out of Medvedev's house, we were going in to talk about WTO, by the way, and there they were. And so in my view, there was an alternative path, an alternative response to the demonstrations. This was not inevitable because of these other factors I talked about. Last straw, of course, you know, this was brewing. This was this way. Then the fall, the government fell January, uh, I mean, February 21st in Kiev. We tried to pack the transition, as we would say in academia. We worked with the opposition. We worked with Prime Minister Yanukovych, poured Vice President Biden called him a dozen times to try to make this transition work. And then it fell apart, February 21st. We were shocked. I was still in Sochi. We didn't know why Yanukovych left. But Putin had a theory based on what I described before. This is the CIA. This is us again. And that's when he just said, to hell with it. I'm done with these guys. We're no longer going to you know, try to cooperate on certain things, even if we disagree. And that's why he went into Crimea and where he went into Ukraine, in my view. So good news and bad news. The good news, I don't believe this is inevitable because of some cultural 
uh, you know, proclivity for dictatorship and anti-Westernism, that we should have conflict with Russia. I don't believe that Putin has a master plan. I think this was emotional, tactical, undermining some other foreign policy objectives he had just a few months, literally just a few weeks earlier. That's the good news. The bad news is I think Putin's locked in. He's done. This is the course he's on. He's fighting Nazis. He's fighting evil. It's hard to negotiate with, with Hitler and the devil, right? That narrative he's now locked into, and I don't see, you know, in the margins he'll change it, but I don't see a way that he gets off that path. Uh, I also remind you he can stay in power till 2024, and he works out three hours a day. He's in good health. The real question is what the West does with all that. And I'll just leave that open uh, for questions. It's clear to me what he's going to do. It's not so clear what our reaction will be over the long haul. But let's do that in questions. Thank you. Thanks for cover. Um, that was really I got eight more slides, man. I That's can keep great. going. Keep going. <laughs> no, that was terrific. That was great. So, um, so let's start. First, a kind of big question, which you, you mentioned briefly, but I know for a lot of people this is a big issue, which is NATO. So NATO expanded a lot after the end of the Cold War. So looking back now, do you think that was mistaken? Did we move too quickly, too far? How would you redo, what, what's your analysis of that? Because that's a very important issue for yep. many people in Russia. It is, but I want to get back to my thesis about it before we talk about counterfactuals in the past. I was in every meeting that President Obama had with Medvedev and Putin let me think about this. No, no. Every meeting except one, OK, for five years. Uh, when I worked at the White House, I was on every phone call between President Medvedev, Prime Minister Putin, and Obama. I can't recall once that the issue of NATO expansion came up. And that, that's just that's a fact. I mean, you can FOIA it. You, freedom of information. You can get my write-ups of these things and get them. That's a fact. And the reason that's important to say is post facto, after the crisis in Ukraine, Putin wants you to believe that what he's doing is in reaction to NATO. Well, NATO expansion, well, NATO expanded in 2002. Why didn't he react then? Uh, moreover, and we're on the record, I'm, I'm assuming, right? OK, so I'm going to choose my words a little more diplomatically here. Um, one of the reasons wasn't, that it wasn't an issue is because NATO wasn't expanding. Uh, Ukraine wasn't asking to be in NATO. Georgia was, but the NATO alliance was very clear uh, that that was not on the table. So it wasn't an issue um, at the time that I was in government. And, and we talked about, uh, I was just reminded of it because our former NATO ambassador was just up at Stanford yesterday. Uh, Medvedev attended the Lisbon NATO summit in 2010. So if you're really interested in this, go look at his speech. Not once does he say, we're really worried about NATO expanding. Exactly the opposite. He said, we have now gotten over the Cold War times. We are now seeking to cooperate with NATO on issues of, of, of mutual interest. And by the way, Russia Today, the same propaganda channel that in 2012 was describing Navalny as my puppet in 2010, because Medvedev was in charge of the editorial direction, was talking about the historic breakthrough between Russia and NATO in 2010. So I don't think you can go back and say all of this problem is created because of the expansion of NATO. You know, I just don't think, just, I'm, you know, I'm not, I haven't been a practicing social scientist for a while, but the causal uh, chain doesn't line up for me. Um, you know, were there alternatives? Perhaps there were alternatives. You know, people debated them. You know, my own view back in the 90s when we were debating it was NATO should expand, uh, but should be left open for all countries that meet the criteria of NATO. Uh, and for me, that meant including Russia. But that's now a kind of, you know, noodlehead academic historical debate. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> at the end, you talked a little bit about Putin staying power and the fact that he's locked in. So in, uh, you had a profile in The New Yorker uh, last August. If, if none of you read that, I, I suggest, I, I urge you to read it. It's a really interesting piece. I don't know what you thought about it. I found it interesting uh, by David Interesting, Rennick. that's a good diplomatic word. Yes. Very interesting, very interesting. And, very um, interesting point you made, Mr. President. Yes. 
And you told David Remnick you thought in the long run uh, the westernizers would win out. So given what you said in your last slide, um, how long is the long run? And if Putin tomorrow uh, dies of a heart attack, hit by a bus, something happens, um, is there, will that be a significant, in other words, is it really about him and the lock-in mentality that you talked about, or is there something bigger that's going to uh, stop us from seeing another reset? So I obviously don't know the answer to that question, and I don't trust anybody who gives you a definitive answer to that question, right? Um, we're not good in academia, and we're certainly the intelligence community that I used to deal with. I, I have a great deal of respect for them, but we're just not good at predicting these kind of long-term things. Um, I was at the White House during the Arab Spring, for instance, and I remember our debates about probabilities of change there, and they were all much more conservative than they should have been in retrospect. Let me say a couple of things. One is uh, I am more pessimistic about that proposition than I have been in 30 years. Just I want to make that clear right at the top that uh, this particular turn has um, the, the strategy for you know, consolidation of the regime, because that's my argument, right, has entailed a turn against the West and a kind of um, set of um, ideologies, I can't think of a better word, or, or arguments that are, are more damaging to that long-term prospect than, than anything I remember most certainly, I lived in the Soviet Union in 1983. This is, this is worse, in my opinion. This is more dangerous. This, is, this feels more visceral, nationalistic, and, and it's, it's in two fronts, right? One, it's anti-American, and Russia and Putin saying, we're going to withstand the imperial America, but it's also anti-liberal, you know? It's, 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 he's, he's, gonna, he's saying, we're, we're going to withstand the decadent Wests, you know, the, these, uh, all this decadence that's happening there as a good social conservative, that's what he would say. I am now the pillar of that, and, you know, that resonates in society, and I don't, I don't want to dismiss that. So the, I want to really underscore I've never been so depressed about that uh, prospect uh, than ever before. And at the same time, uh, I still remain optimistic in the long run, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, I don't believe that 80% of, of the people in Russia support Putinism in all of its, its ways. Yeah, they, every country rallies around the flag when they go to war. And, and you, you all, if you don't watch as much Russian television as I do, you need to understand this is a war that they're fighting, and they're fighting it with us, not Ukrainians. They're fighting it with us. So guess what? People rally behind their leader in times of war. We did when we invaded Afghanistan. 90% of the American people supported the president for that war. And by the way, 75% uh, of the American people supported President Bush when he went into Iraq, including some very leading uh, you know, members of the opposition party, one of whom is going to run for president again, uh, is running, running for president, right? And I just say that not flippantly, but just to remind you that that's what happens in societies even when you have you know, the opportunities to debate. And now remember, this is happening in Russia where there is no opposition in the Congress. There is no real national media that's in opposition. There is no ability to debate these kinds of issues, right? There's pockets of it, and there, there are people that criticize the war, and they, they say uh, sometimes publicly, oftentimes privately with me, this is a giant waste, right? We're just, we're just flushing billions of dollars and 10 years of uh, progress down the toilet. But that's harder to say in that place. Uh, and then, just to remind you, that the opinion polls that show him at these ratings, I used to do survey work in Russia. Uh, imagine in Putin's Russia, uh, you're out there in Siberia in a small town, and Ivan Ivanovich calls you from Moscow and says, do you support Putin? What is the rational thing to say? Of course. I mean, come on. It, you know, uh, uh, given uh, who Ivan Ivanovich might be and given their capabilities in terms of uh, Mr. Snowden made uh, you all aware of our capabilities, well, let me tell you, Russia has incredible capabilities in the same way. So those numbers, I think, are, are, will not stay that way. Uh, what I don't know, you know, the alternative argument is weaker, the opposition is divided, and to predict it in the short term, I don't see it. But, but I will say, just more anecdotally, um, 
you know, I just met too many 25-year-olds that just want to live in a normal country. They don't want to fight Nazis. They don't want to fight evil. They're not interested in, you know, a giant standoff with the United States for the next 30 years. They're quiet now. They're not, they're not demonstrating. They're keeping their heads down. But all those folks that I just showed in that photo in Belotnaya, my proposition to you would be there's not a single one of them that thinks that Russia is better off today than when they were demonstrating. So maybe they'll be quiet now, but will they be quiet for, for 20 years? I just, it's hard for me to imagine. It, so think of that. That's the way I would put it. What's, what takes more imagination? To think that the current regime, the way it's constructed, will still be going strong in 20 years. And by the way, that will be without Putin. Uh, well, maybe 20 years, 40 years. I got it. He's, he's this healthy guy. Um, uh, or that you know, some kind of change will have to happen. Uh, I think the, the, the second is much more probable. So it's a generational thing? In that, I mean, let me just ask, because when we talk about China, for example, we talk about nationalism in China, usually the response is that young people in China are very nationalistic and Correct. can be quickly kind of whipped up through the same apparatus you just spoke about, but you're making it sound different. In no, and that is, no, that is okay. that's exactly what's happening now. You're right about that. And, and I do want to just say, and you know, full disclosure, when the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of people, including myself, were saying, well, the 18-year-olds of that time, we just have to wait for them to come to power and then everything will be fine. It, it, that did not work out. Uh, that way. So I, I don't want to be, be, uh, pretend that I can predict where they're going. Uh, but, you know, this young guy, Yashin, if he were here with us, he's a young you know, Russian opposition leader, he would say, I'm the nationalist. I, I, I want my country to be respected and I want it to be strong and I want it to be prosperous. That's a patriotic uh, claim. Uh, he would say that the, the people in power today are the ones that are undermining those things. So, so that, that debate is not, I want to be clear, that debate is not happening today. It was happening just three years ago. And that it was happening just three years ago makes me think that th this is not the result of a thousand years of Russian history or even you know, 70 years of Soviet communism, but that there's more variation in what, what, what popular attitudes might be um, and of course, you know, another one that, that if, if Putin were here, or I don't want to put words in Putin's mouth because we're on the record. If Putin's uh, backers were here, many of whom I know very well, they would say, uh, you're wrong, Mike, because if we're not in power, the really scary nationalists will come to power, right? The, the Nazis will come to power. And that's why you have to be patient with us as we guide this, this broken society in this transitional period uh, be patient, be patient with Putin because ultimately he's a modernizer, he understands that threat. I don't, I disagree with that radically, but it's, you know, it's a hypothesis about political change in Russia that I think is worth considering. I want to ask you about Ukraine, but just quickly because you mentioned Snowden. So what is, is there anything interesting about Russia keeping Snowden or why are they doing this? What, tell us something about what's happening with that. That guy really ruined my summer. <laughs> he, he really ruined my summer um, uh, in two ways, one, one, one big way, one little way. In the big way, uh, you know, we had planned a big summit with President Putin, and it's not just related to Snowden, but by giving Snowden an asylum, we had to set that aside. Uh, that was, you know, nine months of work wasted. Uh, but one has to wonder, had that meeting happened? Uh, you know, how this other set of dramas might have played out. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to overdo it, but uh, most certainly we believed in our government and, I, and the, the Kremlin believed that we needed that, that two days. We had two days of, of presidential time for Moscow. We lost that, and that, that had negative consequences on the big picture. For me personally, it just meant I had to go be on a secure civets on a video conference with my colleagues from the CIA and the NSA and the State Department for two hours every night from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. for six weeks. So that was no fun. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, by the way, there, there's a debate about Snowden in our country, which if you're interested, we can get into. I, I want to be clear. I think some of the issues he's raised are very important for our constitution, for our society. 
Uh, I just don't know, one, what, you know, uh, the, the stuff he released about foreign relations had anything to do with it. And two, I do think he had an alternative uh, path. I, my, I feel very strongly that he could have done it a different way. That's a different matter. With respect to Russia, I, I think it's done. I mean, um, you know, he's, he's facing uh, a future like other exiles in Russia, and it, they, don't, they don't end very well. In fact, I think he wants to get out from what I've, I'm not in the government anymore, but from other sources in Russia, I think he's realized that to spend the rest of his life in Russia, um, I think he'd prefer to be somewhere else. It appears that way. So last question, and we'll open it up. So with regard to Ukraine and, and Russian, let's say, territorial aggression, are we doing the right thing? Should we be doing more? So generally, I am impressed and supportive of what the Obama administration has done uh, in close coordination with our allies, right? So if you think about the five or six pieces of the strategy that I, I, uh, that I, I would have gone through had I had, had more time, they're basically doing most of them uh, in one way or the other. So uh, if Putin escalates, there needs to be punishment for that, sanctions. They're doing that more. That's part of their policy. Uh, uh, strengthening NATO, that's part of their policy. They're doing pretty well on that. Uh, I was just in Tallinn, as I said, a couple weeks ago. I'm impressed by what we're doing as opposed to what we're not doing. Helping Ukraine succeed. To me, that is actually probably the most important thing. And, and that's what Putin is most focused on, by the way. Putin is not focused, in my view, on acquiring more territory for the Russian Federation, although maybe that'll come later down the road. He's focused on uh, undermining the Ukrainian economy and undermining the, the, the regime there so it'll fail. That the, so then he can say, we told you so, and then they'll come crawling back to get credits from him after the IMF program is extinguished, right? That's his focus. There's, there's, that, I think, in the short term is his focus. So we have to not let that succeed. Uh, fourth, I think we should be involved in, in you know, information war is not the right word, but, but explaining our policy better both to the people of eastern Ukraine but also within Russia. I think that is actually a piece that we're losing rather profoundly on. I think we're, the Russians are doing a much better job on that. Um, so on balance, I think it's pretty good. I worry, you know, I had my worries up there. I worry um, about uh, two or three things. The most important, most immediate worry is keeping the EU and the United States uh, together, maintaining the sanctions until the conditions have been set that there should be sanctions relief. That's a debate. Uh, it's a debate in Europe. It's a debate in Hungary. It's a debate in Greece. It's a debate in some parts of Germany, uh, and that's going to be hard to, to maintain. Um, and then the other piece, I guess if I had one other criticism of the Obama administration, because I don't just want to sound like some Obama hack, um, of which I mostly am, um, uh, you know, the policy looks pretty good. Even the words, you know, if you go and you read uh, President Obama's speech in Estonia, uh, uh, Big lay down of the strategy, right? I, I think it was a great speech. If you look at the words, what sometimes makes me nervous is, and it's, it's actually not usually by the president, it's, it's usually other people in the government, where there's a kind of lack of passion about executing the strategy. There's all this talk about off ramps and you know, getting beyond the bump, and we have other problems, right? Uh, and we do, by the way. I want to make clear, of course, we need to be talking to Putin about Iran, as Secretary Kerry is doing today. But, but I, if you believe me, I think we're going to be in this, this uh, set of circumstances with Russia, not just for a few months, but for years. And so I think we have to kind of, you know, embrace it with a little more passion. Because our, our friends and our allies on the front lines, they need to hear that. Uh, and I'm just reporting to you from a country where I just, you know, in, in Estonia, and there were lots of Lithuanians and Latvians and, and Poles at this meeting, government officials, and that's what they would say if they were here with us tonight. You know, we, we want to make sure that you're with us all the way through.
Great. Thank you.